part two of our discussion on the book Miracle of Forgiveness next on polygamy. What love is this? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, including plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age, but she ran away. That girl was me. I was lost. Then Jesus Christ found me. I found real freedom. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in Him. Welcome back to part two of our discussion of the book Miracle of Forgiveness written by uh, Mormon apostle and then later president of the church, Spencer W. Kimball, with our guest, Aaron Shafawalaf. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> I did it, okay. Um, we have fun with this anyway, but we ended our last time, uh, part one, with um, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 on the verse about being saved by grace. Uh, not by works. In fact, we'll quote the verse and put it up on the screen so that you can see where we're coming from as we continue our discussion. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, what do they not understand not of works? Um, when, when we come to the works of Mormonism and polygamy, and um, the, especially in the repentance process, immediately after uh, Kimball uh, infers that Satan influenced biblical doctrine when he says this, and I want to quote it from page 206. One of the most fallacious doctrines originated by Satan and propounded by man is that man is saved alone by the grace of God. That belief in Jesus Christ alone is all that is needed for salvation. Along with all the other works necessary for man's exaltation in the kingdom of God, this could rule out the need for repentance. It could give license for sin since it does not require man to work out his salvation. Now, he's teaching the devil inspired, inspired at least parts of the Bible, which is blasphemous in my, in my opinion. But we do believe, Christians do believe in repentance, yeah. that we just have a different definition and process of the forgiveness. Yeah, let's talk specifically about the repentance that brings forgiveness. Because every Christian wants to deepen the repentance and uh, uh, mature the repentance toward complete Christlikeness. We want to uh, grow into... Uh, being like the person of Christ completely and perfectly. Mm -hmm. But at what point does forgiveness come? That's the question. That's the question. In Kimball's worldview, that forgiveness comes at the end of the repentance process. But the Bible doesn't have a repentance process. Well, let's put it, it this way. It has a point of repentance, but not a process. There's a, for Christians, uh, <laughs> re forgiveness comes at the beginning I would say, of the repentance process. Mm -hmm. And just to define terms, uh, the repentance that um, caught, that is the instrument through which someone comes to the uh, kingdom of God is a brokenhearted, definitive change of heart. It's not a long process where you right. arrive eventually at right. membership in the kingdom and forgiveness. Now, we could talk about a sanctification process. Which is different where we than take, the forgiveness. We, we take that repentance that we have and that forgiveness that we already have, mm -hmm. and we go deeper and we say, Lord Jesus, change me, having been forgiven having uh, been for and, and adopted. And that answers the question where, where he says it could give us a license for sin. It doesn't at all. I, through uh, our gratitude and through our change of heart, we don't want to do those sins anymore. I would want to ask Spencer Kimball, if someone has a, a broken-hearted child like trusting faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they cry out to uh, Jesus and say, forgive me, I'm sorry, change me, I trust you, you rose from the dead, you are my creator, you are my Lord, you are my Jesus. I would want to ask Spencer Kimball, one, uh, is that person not promised immediate adoption and eternal life and forgiveness now um, in, the, in the New Testament? Also, will God not uh, radically change the heart and behavior uh, and the mind, uh, the renewal of the mind? Um, ought we not be optimistic that a, such a person will be uh, so changed by the Holy Spirit that at final judgment, it, he or she will be a trophy of God? This person, Doris, was forgiven. 
and adopted and loved and accepted. Based on his and book. then she spent decades being uh, matured in Christ, learning to love her enemies. Yeah, but based on his book, what he's written there, his answer would be no. Right. He would say that it you're is. not forgiven until you re complete that process. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Um, and, and we talked about the blessing. The Lord cannot give us a blessing. He says on page 249 uh, that the Lord cannot give us an unearned blessing. Mm -hmm. Yet, don't we have experiences in the Bible? I, I mean, personal, my own personal experiences, I've received blessings from God. I certainly haven't earned. Oh. But I get them because of His goodness, oh, goodness. and His grace, not mine. I, I would, I, I love to ask LDS people on the street, what did Jesus say about that? And yeah. I, on this, I'd yeah. want to say, well, what are some stories Jesus taught about this? We, we have a story of, of someone coming to Jesus, a woman wiping Jesus' feet with her hair, and someone's upset because this is expensive ointment that she's using, and, and uh, Jesus says, I've got a story to tell you. There were two men, both owed a debt to their master, 550 denarii. Uh, they were both forgiven for their debts, and Jesus asks Peter, which of the two will love his master more? And Peter says, I suppose the one who had the greater debt. And Jesus goes on to liken it to this woman's behavior and heart and repentance. And he, he points to her and says, he who is forgiven little loves little. But this, you know, this woman is forgiven much because she loved much. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the logic of Jesus is, if you are forgiven for your debts, this serves as a foundation for loving people more, loving your master more. Mm -hmm. Paul teaches the New Testament, forgive as you've been forgiven. Mm -hmm. Bear with one another as, you know, the Lord is bared with you. Right. Uh, so right. this is uh, one more story real quick. I, this, these are great to geek out on with, with people. Um, <laughs> uh, just memorize a half dozen of them. And if you're going to monologue, Fine. monologue with Jesus Go stories. Go ahead, you betcha. In, in Luke 18, there's the publican and the Pharisee, and they both approach Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the... Uh, the Pharisee says, it, it, it sounds very religious, he says, thank you, God, thank you, thank you, thank you, God, that I'm not like that guy over there. You know, I pay my tithing, I, you know, I, I attend church, I read my scriptures, that kind of thing. All of his very good religious. works, oh, all of his good works. Uh, thank, thank you, Lord, for my, my good works, and I'm not like that guy. And the second person, the publican, says, he doesn't look up, he look, he's down and he beats his chest and he says, I'm not worthy to be called a son of God. Have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Yeah. And Jesus says, that man went home justified. And it's not a long 20, 30, 40 year process that Kimball prescribes right. for achieving eventually forgiveness. <clears throat> this man is forgiven. Immediately forgiven. That's, that's profound. That should haunt anyone who believes that someone like Spencer Kimball has uh, any that, gospel credibility. And that word justified needs to be defined precisely how the Bible intends it to mean, and that is forgiven. Forgiven, as if counted righteous. Counted as being righteous. Oh, goodness, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So God does bless those who haven't earned blessings. Amen. Right? Is through our faith. And of course, in Acts uh, 14 and, and Matthew 5, it talks about that God uh, sends his blessings in the rain and joy of heart and, and um, food into the righteous as well as yeah. the unrighteous. So he does indeed. Uh, bless thus those who haven't earned blessings. Um, he said number the point number eight on page three fifteen that you used was that we must measure up to the celestial. So he's telling us to do that here in the in our mortality mm. to measure up to the celestial. What exactly is is he saying we need to do there? Well, earlier scriptures that, teach that there's. A celestial law. There's a law according to each kingdom. There's a right. law fitting or in accordance with each kingdom. And the traditional LDS teaching has been that your behavior, your qualifications will match up to, they will measure up to one of those laws. Um, what's what's mind-boggling to me is that in the Old Testament, we're given the Mosaic law, which really does call for loving God with all your heart, mind, right. soul, and strength. Mm -hmm. And we're shown to be fundamentally uh, unqualified to do this. We're, we're not able. We are not well, able Moses to keep this said, law. Moses said, you can't do this. It, it, he told it them that. It brings knowledge of sin, as Paul says, that mm -hmm. the law exposes our inability to keep the law. It doesn't supply what it demands. And so Mormon culture teachings, uh, Mormon leadership has taught, well, now we have the Sermon on the Mount where we have what they call the gospel law. It's a harder, stricter, deeper mm -hmm. law than the Mosaic law. Mm -hmm. And now if we keep that celestial law, then we'll, be, then we'll earn exaltation. So that's measuring up to the celestial is 
the Sermon on the Mount, obeying all of its precepts? Well, there's, there's two things I'd say to this. One is, if you do have a kingdom heart, a kingdom citizenship, if, if you do have the heart that re repents in the sense of having a change of heart and you trust the Lord, that's a miracle. If you become the kind of person described by Jesus as someone, blessed are those who mourn, mm -hmm. blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Um, if you become the kind of person that at heart, uh, the, the, the king, Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount, that's a miracle. But uh, this was not given as a set of perfectionistic standards that someone must someday achieve and then they will be forgiven. That, that's mm -hmm. just not the point of it. So. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the same passage, in this same page, Kimball wrote that even though repentance is worthwhile, um, there's no spirit world repentance that can recompense for what should have been done yeah. here. So why do they baptize for the dead? Um, well, I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Kimball argues that you can't accomplish in the spirit world, spirit prison, what you have the opportunity to accomplish here but failed to. So this is in contrast with this modern LDS optimism of having sort of a backup plan where what I failed to do in this life, I'll have a second opportunity to do it there. But LDS but leaders... he says they can't. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. And they're like, well, what, they, what Kimball really thinks the spirit world repentance will be suitable for is accomplishing things that you didn't have the opportunity to do here. Oh, so, but, okay. But modern LDS people, I think, stretch this and they say, oh, my, uh, all my moral failures, I'll take care of those. I'll finally I'll achieve care of forgiveness yeah. and complete repentance in the afterlife. Kimball's not using this as an escape hatch or backup plan. Uh, the, it is not as hopeful as people think it is. A lot of people say, well, just read the last three chapters. It's got more gracious rhetoric and tone. He never, <laughs> he never reverses I didn't these find impossible that. standards. No, I didn't find that. Okay, number nine, also from page 321, he said, we have time to pay off our debts before that awesome day of judgment arrives. Now, the context is full repentance and living a life of righteousness after repentance. Yeah, he says it's very perfectionistic. He says, Oh my elsewhere, goodness, I'll say. He says, quote, living all the commandments guarantees total forgiveness of sins. Yeah. Uh, he says that page yeah. 28, 209. Uh -huh. And he says 70 years is enough to do this, and, and 313 and 314. Um, se 70 years is more than enough uh, to achieve this sort of sufficient. Uh, 70 complete... years being how old a person is when they die, maybe. Is yeah, maybe yeah the average lifespan needed okay. to kind of reach a point where you're living all the commandments. Okay. And you've stopped. Uh, you've completed the repentance process. Now, what's just strange about this rhetoric is I, no person after five minutes of conversation realistically thinks they're going to reach perfection in this life. Nobody. So they have to push out the finality of forgiveness into the afterlife in Mormonism. Um, but to believers, this is, to, to Christians, this is just madness. Well, we, yeah, it is madness, absolute madness. Because you're, you're not depending upon what God has said he will do in us. Of course, the Holy Spirit is what does it in us. And, and they, they even teach that if you sin, the Holy Spirit will leave you. So that you don't have any power. It's very provisional and fickle yeah. and temporary and losable. Uh, this, this, this analogy helps me. If my wife and I are at odds, if we have uh, a matter to be settled, if, if one of us needs to forgive the other, and there's ice in the, in the kitchen, as it were, and, and, and there's, um, there's, there's reconciliation that, need, that needs to happen. It's super inappropriate for me to act like everything's okay. And if you're before a holy God and you've yet to be completely forgiven of your sins, you have no business speaking in positive terms about your relationship with God. So people who think, well, he'll finally forgive me someday in the future or in the afterlife. No, the Bible says it is completely inappropriate for you to think that you are anything other, other than under condemnation apart from having been mm -hmm. freely justified and forgiven mm -hmm. in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and faith alone. So I, I, one more thing is I love the idea of a safe space uh, for kids especially. Um, children have a whole, think about my, two of my daughters are adopted. And we adopted them as babies. And they come into my home, and the home is a safe place to screw up. It's a safe place to mess yeah. up and mm -hmm. make horrible mistakes because mommy and daddy love you. You're in a safe place. Um, adoption. And expect it. Oh, we yeah. expect them to screw Absolutely. up. And God expects us to screw up. He knows we will. 
we came to the front door as believers of God's house, and we were dirty, uh, we were uh, messy, uh, we had foul language on our mouth, so to Not speak. Not worthy. We needed a bath. Um, and we, you know what he did? He brought us to the front door into a safe place. He permanently adopted us by faith. We're not like, uh, this isn't like ancient foster care system where you're, you know, you're like, oh no, I'm going to get kicked yeah, out. And, uh, yeah. uh, no, he, he adopts you. Mm -hmm. He seals you. He becomes your father by faith and you become into the family. And being a Christian means trusting uh, as a child in the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you into his house uh, today. And, and, and that to be your safe place, not so that you can on purpose develop a life of sin, but so that you can have a safe place so that when you sin, you can immediately go to the Father and say, I'm sorry, forgive me. And the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He is He's faithful, faithful and, and just, just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then He'll brush us off, put us on our feet and show us the right way to go. Having been forgiven. Right. Having been forgiven already. Imagine, right. imagine your that. spouse saying, someday I'll forgive you. <laughs> someday, in the far future, I'll forgive you. No. Well, there's some who do that. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. It's not, it's not Christ like. It's, it's not Christ like. He places conditions on repentance. And he says that on page 354. And we've already discussed some of this, uh, but it gives us time to go into a little more deeply um, where he said, we must have the repentance which merits forgiveness. Now, what kind of repentance is that? And he also includes that, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God, meaning that if we don't do this, our hearts aren't pure and we won't see God. The two main errors that Kim, Spencer Kimball makes with repentance is he thinks that repentance helps you earn or merit forgiveness in eternal life. Mm -hmm. The second is that he puts too much into the definition of the repentance that brings forgiveness to make it unrealistic. So he makes it a long drawn out process of achieving for, uh, perfection and then you arrive at forgiveness. The, the two errors here are, no, repentance is not meant to earn forgiveness. Repentance instead is to it's, it's, it's a, the changing of our hearts where we arrive at the conclusion that we don't merit forgiveness and that Christ alone merits it. And the other thing is, and this is a beautiful truth to me, um, the repentance that brings forgiveness, that immediately brings forgiveness, is a childlike, incomplete, fickle, weak, underdeveloped, incipient, uh, just getting started repentance. Mm -hmm. Great example of this is Zacchaeus. Mm -hmm. Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your home today, this short guy, and he's and Zacchaeus is overwhelmed by the love of Jesus Christ. And he, you know, he stands up and he says, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give back fourfold what I've exploited out of the people as a tax collector. And Jesus says, he looks at him and he says, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, salvation has come to this man's house today. This today. is a son of Abraham right yeah. here. And this Zacchaeus, it's interesting because in, in Spencer Kimball's worldview, until you complete maximal possible restitution, you can't be forgiven. That's right. why he, he argues murderers can't be forgiven, people in prison right, can't be forgiven. Right. But Jesus, hearing this man's change of heart and merely the announcement that he intends to pay them back, mm -hmm. he, it's just salvation. All of a sudden, right here. It's, it's there. right here. Just like that. Just like the thief on the cross. Just like that. Yeah. Just like the woman caught in adultery. Just like that. Neither do yeah. I condemn you. It's just so, it's there and it's immediate. Yeah. And, and later, Kimball says um, that repentance can sometimes take months and years and decades and even centuries to complete before forgiveness is achieved. How hopeless is that? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really inappropriate. The way that the scriptures speak is that forgiveness is what began our relationship with God. Yes. Having eternal life is, and the gift of the Holy Spirit and adoption and justification union with Christ, mm -hmm. as though sealed with Christ forever. All of that is the, 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 it's the starting point and the foundation of our whole relationship with Jesus. It's not the, the end, it's not the, at the finish line, it's at the starting uh, line. And um, yeah, yeah, th yeah, this idea that, uh, I, I would love to ask Kimball, just, I, I would love to be <laughs> stuck in a room with him uh, while he was still living and ask him, what sins do you struggle with? Because you're, yeah, you know, you, that like, would have been a good like, question. Tell me, like, what, what habits have you yet to completely conquer? Would he admit them? Because there's a lot of LDS people out there, especially youth that I've talked to, who think, well, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm not like those, you know, our leaders who, 
who are near perfect, you know, and they just yeah, have this uh -huh. sense of their leaders like, oh, they can do no wrong. And like, the same in the polygamy group. And you don't, even even in, in that context, you don't dare admit your sins. And uh, certainly the leaders never would. The Apostle Paul says, I do the things I don't want to do. Yeah, and, and yeah. He, he says, well, yeah, a thorn in the he's flesh. He's the worst of sinners, he, too. Yeah. A, a good Christian leader, I think, will display a humility that they are still depending on the daily uh, repentance, faith, uh, refreshing uh, grace of God every day. Mm -hmm. I, I, a, go, a good Christian leader will publicly let you know sometimes the things that they're, that they're seriously struggling, struggling with. with. As well. LDS leaders don't do that. The peace that comes with forgiveness must be earned, he says in page 363. And then, and this boggled my mind, then he writes that the wealthy spend much money to gain peace only to find out that it's not for sale and that the poorest of people can have it if the total price is paid. He's got contradictions going on all over the place in that. The, the rich can't buy it, but the poor people can. In, in, in Isaiah, God says, you know, come and, and purchase what I have for you without money. It's yeah, free. without money, without price. This is super interesting. The, the, back to the accounting metaphor in Romans 4 with Paul. Paul says, to the one who does not work. So I think about two examples. One is, uh, imagine going to a temp agency, a government institution that's helping you develop skills so that you can earn your paycheck. And you might be able to say, oh, I thank you. Thanks to Susie, who was my, my agent at the, collect, at the uh, temp agency who helped me get a job and earn my paycheck. That's not a good metaphor for grace in mm -hmm, God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. It's more that you're homeless and you've got a cup and it's empty. Yep. And you show up to the welfare office, as it were, and you walk into the front door and you say, I'm bankrupt, I've got nothing, I can't earn this, I've got nothing to offer, I could just really use some help right now, would you please have mercy on me? And what's super interesting about that metaphor is that when there was uh, cultural debates, um, th I think in the 60s, uh, over welfare, uh, you can do general conference sermon uh, searches over this, uh, LDS leaders would use uh, their opposition to welfare as, as, a, as a parallel or an analogy to the kingdom of God and grace. And that no, you're not going to have any government dole who's going to give you unmerited grace. You've got to earn this, dang mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, mm -hmm. No matter your political views on any of this, when it comes to the kingdom of God, of grace, showing up to God's front door is a whole lot more like being a beggar, filthy, smell, smelly, uh, dirty, uh, unqualified I'm, so, I'm bankrupt. Help me. I, my, my hands are empty. I've got nothing to offer. Um, yeah. I, I like to use the, it's in Zechariah where Joshua the high priest is standing uh, before God in his, in his filthy garments. And, and, and uh, the, the angel says, take off his garments and put on fresh mm. ones. And, you know, he's standing there and the, gar the dirty garments are removed and huh. the clean garments are put on. And what does he do? But just stand there and let that happen. He doesn't oh, work for it. He doesn't even ask for it. It just, he's there and it happens. Mm. And then we're told in the New Testament to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, which of mm. course his garments are spotless. So yeah. what do we do? Nothing. We let him do, He let him, allow him, invite him to make us worthy because we can't make ourselves worthy. Christ is worthy on our behalf. That is absolutely, and we yeah. talked about that last time. Okay, so um, before we continue, we've got a few minutes left on this. Are we ready? Do we want to do three, or, or are you? Be glad to. Are you ready to do three? Okay. By the I'll, way, thank you. I really and, enjoy this. And thank you. I really appreciate. It. I'm enjoying it too. Um, as I read through the book, and and as I was choosing specific portions, not only what you had posted on Facebook, but also some of the things that came out in my, in my own observation, I noticed that Kimball quoted in the book dozens and dozens of times from the Bible. Hmm. Many, many, many different Bible passages he quoted. Now, in my experience in exchanging ideas with LDS people and with polygamous people, if you quote from the Bible, they'll say, oh, but you can't trust the Bible. It's through as many as translations, it's lost a lot of its meaning. Why do they get to quote it and we don't? It's selective. It's convenient. I, I think this is... Uh... This is inappropriate of LDS people to, to speak in such optimistic, high, 
uh, loving terms toward the Bible. Oh, we love the Bible. We love, the, and mm -hmm. then to to have a kind of fallback mechanism of plausible deniability when there's any text that seems like it might oppose or contrast with LDS teachings. Well, there's this sort of vague appeal to well, it's not transmitted or translated correctly, or uh, it's been corrupted. Right. Or plain and precious truths have been taken right. out. Right. I think it's inconsistent, and I think that um, it would be interesting. To, I I want to. It's almost. I want to ask LDS leaders. Just give us a list of where you think corruptions yeah, are. The specific exactly. ones, or the lost books that you think should have been included, and we'll just start from there. But don't play this ambiguous game of plausible deniability. Right. Um, it's like being mad at someone, and not. And, and I'm mad at you. Well, well what did well, I do? Why? Well, you know. there's stuff. There, you know, there's stuff. <laughs> <You> know. <laughs> exactly. And then, and I can't remember the quote, and I just read it just a couple of days ago, um, who the a Mormon person said um, that if there is anything wrong with the Bible, it is the prophet or anybody who can correct it. It is their job to do so. Hmm. And yet none of them have. Hmm. Joseph Smith tried with his Bible revision, but he didn't change all of the problem passages either. You could use the Joseph Smith translation to argue against modern Mormonism. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, and I've used it a lot to argue against some of their doctrine against baptism for the dead and against polygamy and certainly against the three degrees of glory, all of that. Uh, yeah, you mm -hmm. can. You can. Absolutely. Okay, so we have uh, just a little over a minute now. Um, in fact, I'll open up our next part three with this quote from Brigham Young who said, challenged us, and we'll take part three to do this, take up the Bible, compare the religion of the Latter-day Saints with it, and see if it will stand the test. Okay? Sounds good. So, <laughs> so we take the challenge, and I don't know about you, but I've been criticized for doing that very thing that he has said, what do you do? And we just talked about, well, we can't trust the Bible. And Jesus says, have you not heard it? said or is it not written? Jesus, I like to tell people, Jesus has a higher view of the Bible than you do. He's a higher view of the Old Testament than you do. Mm -hmm. he, he loves to appeal to the written word and even the particularities of the grammar. Uh, so we should have a very high view of scripture and appeal to it like Jesus did to make our case. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And he said also in another context though, you don't know, neither know yeah. the scriptures nor the power of God. And, and we have to uh, apply that power of God to his ability to maintain the integrity of the scriptures through all the years and the translations. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away, Jesus right. says. So we should have a default optimism at the very least about the, uh, the preservation of the Word of God and the integrity of the Word of God. Mm -hmm, exactly. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to work with that a little bit on part three of our interview as we discuss more thoroughly the book Miracle of Forgiveness written by Spencer W. Kimball, who claims that we need to have a long drawn out uh, process of repentance before we can ever achieve the forgiveness that the Bible says is given to us freely in Jesus Christ. See you next time.